about to leave Already packing, come with me I'm not really asking We'll get away to a place where we don't know About to see the world in action What we can be, life with no distractions We'll get away, this is what we waited for Good afternoon, stroke early evening. It's Jim here at Tutor to You. I've parked my camel. There he is. <laughs> Humphrey. Humphrey Camel. And uh, which, which can only mean one thing. It must be time for our latest live GCSE Geography Revision session with Suzanne, top left. Vicky, my bottom <laughs> left. Must mean that Brendan is bottom right. And it's hot deserts tonight. I almost said hot desserts and that would be wrong, wouldn't it? <laughs> Um, but here we go. I mean, we had a fantastic session last week on cold environments, and now we flick the subject over to hot deserts. And uh, Brendan, do you want to give us a <laughs> thank you, Brendan? You want to give us a quick overview as to what we're going to cover, and then we'll get straight into the various revision activities. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Well pronounced there, by the way. Thank you. Uh, because remember, deserts only has one S. Um, so just in case any of you accidentally spell it with two, deserts tend to be salty. One S. And desserts are sugary and sweet. Oh, we're not nice. talking about those today. Okay. I know you like them, but we're not talking about those today. So, yeah, <laughs> moving from cold environments to hot deserts. These are all fascinating topics. The thing is, hot deserts and cold environments are an option that your teachers will have chosen for you. So maybe they chose hot deserts. If they didn't, it doesn't matter. Don't say, oops, I'm in the wrong place. Stay and you may learn some really interesting stuff today. So that's going to be together with uh, my colleagues, uh, Suzanne and Vicky. And we're going to be looking at a few different uh, activities, which will hopefully be quite an enjoyable way for you to do some retrieval practice on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon. Of course, if you're watching this in replay, you can always, um, you know, follow along and um, look, maybe don't look at the answers. You know, that's a good point. Right. That's a good point, Brendan. Yeah. If you're watching on replay, of course, you can pause the video, can't you? And you give yourself some extra time, whereas the... Our guests in the live chat are on on the button here. They have to be fairly quick. 
Excellent. Shall we start? Okay, let's go for it, yeah. Brilliant. We're going we're gonna to start off with the bubble quiz. So the bubble quiz, as you're probably familiar with, uh, there are four possible answers. And the thing is, it's not like multiple choice because any number of those four can be correct from none of them to all four of them. Okay, so let's see the first question. The first question this evening is hot deserts are mainly found outside the tropics, along the tropics, south of the equator or along the equator. So which of those answers is or are correct? Make your choices. So let's see what the correct answer to that one is. They are found mainly along the tropics. OK, so you need to know where deserts are found in relation to the lines of latitude. Let's see number two. So number two is which of these adaptations are found in hot desert plants? You need to know your adaptations. So is it large flat leaves, very long tap roots, water storage in the stem, or rapid life cycles? Remember, it could be none of those or any number up to four of those. Let's see what you're guessing or correctly answering. So it can be, let's have a look at the answer to number two, Jim. So the correct answer to that one is three of them are correct. They can have very long tap roots, water can be stored in the stem, and they tend to have very rapid life cycles because the uh, you know the heat means that they don't, perhaps don't get so much time to have water around. The large flat leaves uh, is the wrong answer because that's the sort of thing you would see in a tropical rainforest. Let's see the next question. Which of these total annual rainfall amounts are typical of hot deserts? Would it be? 400 millimeters, 200 millimeters, 300 millimeters, or 100 millimeters? Which of those would be found in a typical desert? To make your selections, it can be one, two, three, four, or none of them. And we'll see the answer now. And the correct answer is that it's B and D because deserts to be classified as a hot desert really have to have rainfall amounts under 250 millimeters each year. So A and C would be incorrect there. Let's have a look at question number three, a uh, four, sorry. How can tree planting reduce desertification? There are four possible answers. Could it be decomposing leaf litter adds nutrients? Could it be shade from leaves reduces water loss? Could it be roots stabilize soil and dunes? Or could it be provides more fuel wood? Which of those would you say are correct? Not one, two, three, or four of them. Make your choices. Let's have a look at the answers and in this case all of them are correct okay so hopefully you you got that let's have a look at number five question number five is which of the following are used in order to reduce desertification you need to know about desertification so and you need to know how, how it's managed so which ones might be used to reduce it national parks selective logging, planting drought resistant shrubs, or marine parks. Have a think about those and make your guesses. Could be zero, one, two, three, or four of those are correct. And the correct answer is that it is two of them, which it would be national parks and plant planting drought resistant shrubs. Okay, so that's the bubble quiz done and dusted. <clears throat> We're now gonna move on uh, with Suzanne to have a look at a climate graph. Over to you, Suzanne. 
Thank you. Okay, right. Now we're going to be looking at a climate graph and trying to interpret um, them, which will be could be a skill that you'd be asked to do on any test papers or any exam that you might sit in school. So question number one is what is the highest average temperature in degrees Celsius of any month? So take a look at the graph and have a look at where you think the highest temperature is. And if you're playing live, pop it in the chat box. And if you're playing at home later, then you might like to pause it and just check out what you think your answer is. Right. OK, I've got a few. Waiting for a few to come through here on the chat. What do you reckon? What's the highest average temperature? Yeah, I've got one come through. Great stuff. Are we going to have some more coming through? Let's have a reveal. Brilliant. OK, so the highest average temperature you can see is 33 degrees Celsius. And that's because the temperature is shown by the line. So the line on the graph is showing us the temperature. And we make sure that we read the temperature here on the correct scale. And the correct scale, as you can see, is on the right hand side right hand side axes. Right, question number two. So what is the highest total precipitation in millimetres of any one month? So if you remember what I've just said about how temperature is um, shown on this graph, have to think about how the um, rainfall would be represented or precipitation. Let's pop those in. Okay, can I have a reveal please? And it's 16 millimetres. OK, right. On to our question number three. What is the temperature range in degrees Celsius shown on the climate graph? OK, so you've got to remind yourself what the term range means. OK, think about what the term range means. So you're looking at what you think would be the temperature range. So see if you can give it a go and then I might give you a clue. So let's see if you've got any in the chat box. If you're watching afterwards, just pause and try and work it out. OK. Lovely. OK, let's have a look then. I can see some answers coming through. Let's see the answer for that one, please. It's D, which is 17 degrees. So it's actually taking the um, highest temperature and deducting or subtracting the lowest temperature. So that would mean that 17 degrees is our range between the highest and the lowest months. Right, question number four, please. So in this question, it's selecting the correct adjective for the temperature range shown on this climate graph. So is it A, diurnal, B, vernal, C, annual, or D, autumnal? So which of those words do you think, or adjectives do you think, describes the temperature range shown on the climate graph? Have a look at the number of... Um, have a think about what that climate graph is showing you. Okay, have we got anything coming through yet? Have a guess. Have a think. What do you think it is? Right. Okay. Oh, I think this one's thrown some of you. Maybe thrown some of you at home. So let's have a look at what the answer is. It's C, annual. So looking at this, we are looking at the difference between the temperatures of the warmest and the coldest years, looking at that. Vernal is spring, diurnal is the difference between the day and night, and obviously autumnal is the autumn season. Right, okay, number five, please. So which factor contributes significantly to the fact that hot deserts can have very cold nights? Is it A, cloudy skies? B, a lack of clouds, C, thunder clouds, or D, rain clouds. So can you put your um, answers in now, please? See if you can put those in the live chat. If you're at home, write down your answer, see whether you can get it right. Okay. 
Yay. Okay, let's have the reveal, please. Lovely. Okay, so it's lack of clouds. So the lack of clouds actually means that any warm air will actually not it the, the cloud if there was cloud cover it would trap some of the warm air so it actually gets very very cold at night because it allows it to um leave right um move on to i think on balance now it's over to oh no, it's, sorry categorize over to vicky Thank you very much. So this activity, we are going to have a look at, uh, we've got sorry, eight phrases and they are either arid or semi-arid. So arid to do with hot deserts, semi-arid to do with those areas of land close to hot deserts that border them. So you're going to have 60 seconds to separate these eight phrases or words into those two correct uh, columns. So what we need from you is arid and then the numbers that you think go with arid and semi-arid and the numbers that you think go with those. Um, they may not be equally split up. Jim, can we have 60 seconds on the clock, please? Thank you very much. So have a think, which ones do you think relate to hot deserts, those arid environments? Which ones would be on the fringes of the desert in those semi-arid environments? Okay, pop your answers in the chat window. If you're watching live, if you're watching the record, remember to pop us on pause if you need to, if you need a little bit more time while you note down your answers. We've got some good answers coming through at the moment. Ben, well done. Uh, Jim, can we please have the answers? Thank you very much. So we'll have a quick chat through these. So no rains for decades. In some places, um, in some desert areas, there has actually no, has been no rain for over 400 years. We're talking about parts of the um, Atacama Desert in Chile here, which is the world's driest desert. Um, Khartoum in Sudan only has 19 days a year with uh, where they record more than one millimetre of rain. And obviously we know that gen hot deserts generally have very low and very unreliable rainfall. And um, the Sahara is uh, probably the most famous of all the deserts. It's the biggest. It measures over 9 million square uh, kilometres. You've also got things like the Australian desert. You've got the USA's uh, Great Western Desert, which lots of you will have studied. Uh, Tar Desert that we are going to be looking at later in this session as well. Gobi, Kalahari, all sorts the desert there and it does have very little vegetation so desert soils are really really dry we know that they have uh, they are really infertile one of the reasons for that is because they're patient so it means they don't really get any nutrients returned to the soil and there's lots of leaching and evaporation taking place as well so salt is drawn to the top the vegetation that does manage to survive has to really adapt to the harsh conditions and we're going to have a look at the ways they do that in one of the um, activities a little bit later so we have a look at the semi-arid uh, answers they have a short reliable rainfall season which usually lasts for a few months so that does mean that they are able to grow some vegetation so much of this is uh, grassland but you will find drought resistant trees like the baobab and the acacia trees and they grow really quickly in the rain and then it tends to so the, sorry the grass grows really quickly in the rain and it tends to die back um, in the wet in the dry season you also have seasonal crops that can be grown and this is obviously really handy because the main source of income here is farming so that is really really important okay and we should know that desertification is a real problem in these areas so it's a process of the um grasslands turning into desert and that's caused by all sorts of things overpopulation climate change so overgrazing for example deforestation um, over cultivation and they all 
um, end up with soil erosion. And the area at most risk of that in the world currently is the Sahel. It's a really large area, borders the south, southern edge of the Sahara Desert, that great big long strip, and it's home to over 50 million people. And unfortunately, they have very little money or technology to help them adapt to this, um, this problem. So those are our types of um, hot environment that we're looking at. Um, hopefully, you understand the difference between the two. And obviously, uh, knowing things about desertification and the Sahel and facts about the Sahara would be really, really handy in those longer answer questions in your exam. Thank you, Jim. Can we return over to Brendan for the connection wall, please? Ah, case studies. The Tar Desert, not the Thar Desert, the Tar Desert. Look at where it is. It's right on the border between India and Pakistan. And in fact, uh, one of the world's great rivers runs more or less through it, the Indus in some, much the same way as the River Nile runs through the Sahara. So the vegetation is quite sparse. It's about 200,000 square miles. Uh, in comparison to other hot deserts, quite a lot of people live there. And uh, I have to say, it's one of the few hot deserts of the world I've been lucky enough to visit. And some of those cities actually have some really spectacular um, sites to see and very interesting culture. Um, you need to know, as you do with all case studies, what the economic opportunities are there and like any other area of the world there's going to be some mineral extraction uh, some agriculture going on <clears throat> energy production and tourism as well which i just mentioned uh, the many challenges too as with all hot deserts water is in short supply and they will find ways of managing that so there are some really quite spectacular schemes that have done that in that part of the world uh, the climate also makes transportation quite difficult in that part of the world, so it's quite inaccessible. And desertification, especially around the, de the uh, desert, is a big issue, as it is with other deserts too. So we're going to look at a connection wall to see if you can spot uh, groups of things. So there are four groups here. Let's have see if you can spot the first group. There is one group that's probably easier than others, I would suggest to you. So see if you can spot the first group of four in this selection on the connection wall. So I did suggest to you there might be quite a lot of people living in this desert compared to others, and they tend to live in cities. So let's look for the first grouping. The first grouping uh, we can look for is that there are four cities there. So the four cities, if we have a look at those, Jim, are Jaisalmer, Jodhpur, Jaipur, and Bikaner. Apologies if I pronounced any of those incorrectly. Let's see if we can find another group on that wall. So perhaps if you consider this time some of the, the fact that you do need to know about the natural environment that's going on there. So the, the next group we might look for, try and find those, is they are connected by the physical geography of that region. So there are mobile sand dunes, sparse vegetation, sandy hills, and very, very low precipitation. Let's look for another group of four. Slightly trickier to spot these. Once we get the, th the third group, we can spot the last group, but it's what's their connection. So the third group we're looking for is going to be the economic opportunities of the Tar Desert. So we're looking at, if we have a look at those, Jim, the mineral extraction, tourism, energy, and farming. So agriculture, very important in these areas. So we, we've got four things remaining. What we want to do is see if you can identify what those things are in common. What have those remaining things got in common? And this is something that you need to know about for all of your living environment case studies. 
So we've got four remaining, overgrazing, soil erosion, salinization, and habitat loss. How would you categorize those things? Let's look and see what the answer is to that one. They are all environmental challenges in the tar desert. So whichever desert you look at, you need to know about those four groups of things. Well done, everybody, if you got those. And we're next going to be looking at On Balance with Vicky. OK, thank you very much. So with this activity, we're going to have a look at the advantages and disadvantages of developing tourism in hot desert areas. So the first thing that I would like you to do is try to come up with two advantages of developing tourism in these areas. Again, pop them in the chat window if you're watching live. If you're watching the record, then pop us on pause for a moment if you need to and make some notes down on a piece of paper or something. And then when you're done, you can obviously unpause this and have a look at what we've come up with. So have good points with tourism, some of the things that might be advantageous to the people living in those desert areas. Uh, Jim, can we have the timer on, please? There's no time on this oh, one, Vicky. Get, we don't uh, get time with this. Sorry, yeah, that's me forgetting that we don't have time with this one. Putting their eyes, ears into Perfect. the chat window or okay, jotting so, them down. Yeah. So we'll give you a we'll give you a few seconds. See what's coming through on the chat window. Um, once we've got a couple of answers coming through, we'll um, we'll have a look, and then we'll have a look at this one as well. Sorry, Jim, that was completely my fault. That's all right. We might give you a timer later if you're good. <laughs> Okay, we'll give you a few more seconds to pop something on the chat window. Excellent. Thank you, Jim. Can we see what's uh, popping up on the advantages scale, please? Thank you very much. So um, tourism, we know, provides income or extra income for local people. Um, and we know that, that the desert is an area where actually um, any sort of economic gain is going to be beneficial to the people there. If it is ecosystem, it can increase visitors' awareness of the value and threats to biodiversity. So you can educate your visitors while they are also enjoying their holidays. Um, when we're talking about that income, we're talking about local people maybe being able to provide food, they perhaps can provide accommodation, they could even act as tour guides. Um, and also in these areas, tourism is can be the most important source of income, particularly in the Western desert in the USA that lots of you will have studied for a case study. Think about the Grand Canyon, think about Las Vegas, think about the millions of people that visit those places each year. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at the disadvantages now. So if you can, um, again, pop your answers into the chat window. Again, if you're watching a record, then just give yourself a few moments. We're looking at the disadvantage this time. So why perhaps should we not develop tourism in these hot desert areas? Off you go. And excellent, Ben, that's a really good point. There are some really unique opportunities in deserts that, could, that could be exploited. Okay, so again, thinking about what's not good about tourism, what would be the, some potential uh, bad impacts of tourism? Okay, we'll just give you a few moments to pop things in the chat window there. Super, we've got some interesting ideas coming through here. So Jim, can we have the disadvantages shown onto the screen, please? Thank you very much. So excellent. We've got um, popping it up in the chat window. We've got destruction of important ha important habitats, and that links to what's on the screen here. So large numbers of tourists can lead to various negative environmental impacts, and also water stress. So absolutely, they can cause erosion, they can cause litter, they can trample the vegetation, all sorts of things there. So they could destroy those important habitats, and it would cause us stress on the environment. And also, you've got water stress, so particularly where you've got luxury um, tourism taking place. Those great big hotels in Las Vegas, for example, would cause all sorts of possible issues with over um, abstraction, particularly from the Colorado River in that area. Um, tourism can be quite unreliable as well. So for example, if there's a major economic um, 
crash, for example, or a health crisis. Obviously, COVID is a really good example of that. Tourism um, is really on hold at the moment, which means there could be a cause, you know, they could have a decline in demand, which therefore means people won't be earning the money that they would expect to be. Um, think about also things like um, terrorist threats across the sort of the northern Sahara. That's had a massive impact in tourism numbers over the years as well. Accessibility is another thing here. Big issue along with this extreme environment. But things like driving off road in those really hot deserts can be really, really dangerous. So that, again, isn't always great for tourism. Right. That's me done. So we can hand back over to my true or false. Thank you. Okay, so another case study alert. So this time we're going to be having a look at the Western Desert in the USA. And again, what you will need to know for this um, case study is the development opportunities. So we've covered some of those in some of the previous questions, but you will be looking at things like tourism for the western desert las vegas particularly i'm sure you've all heard of las vegas which receives 31 million tourists a year this area is also renowned for growing salad crops and horticulture but using irrigated water which they draw from the river colorado you've also got large areas of mineral development which has um, impacts on the um, hot desert environment but also um, a great source of energy exploitation with hydroelectric power from dams across the river colorado and also from solar farms that can be um, built all across the desert you will also need to have a look at the challenges of developing the hot desert. So working out how people live with those extreme environments. And there are a number of adaptations of housing that could be looked at. And also xeriscaping, where the new houses in Las Vegas must actually adhere to new plans or new controls to make sure that not all of the garden area or the yard is um, grassed over. They have to use more natural scaping for um, the hot desert environment. So they use more cactus and things that are more drought tolerant. There's lots of issues and challenges with water supplies, we've heard. Um, demands in water abstraction from the rivers has led to a lot of issues of water stress. And Lake Mead, which supplies Las Vegas, has actually in the last couple of years reached drought conditions um, and they've actually had to stop supply for some users from that um from that supply right so we're going to have some true and false, quest false questions on the usa's western desert so if you are playing at home live please pop your answers into the chat box um, if you are watching on replay then just pause jot down your answer and then watch for the reveal right so question number one the usa's western desert region is in fact three deserts the saharan mojav and chichuan is that true or is that false decide and pop your answer in or pop your answer down. Okay, brilliant. We've got one come through. I'm going to get a few more. Right, let's have the reveal. It is false. So it was almost looked almost right. It's actually the Sonoran Mojave and Chichuan Desert. So that S, the Saharan was there to throw you. Right, question number two, please. Climate conditions in the USA's western deserts are so challenging that hardly anyone can live there. Pop your answer down. If you're at home, write it on a piece of paper. If you're watching live, if you can pop it in the chat box. Okay. Right, let's have our reveal, please. Fab, so this is false. They are quite challenging, but it's it, not challenging enough for no one to live there. So there are ways, adaptations and ways that um, people have mitigated the effects of living in extreme temperatures in order to be able to inhabit this area. Right. Question number three. So one of the world's largest rivers runs through the desert, providing water for irrigation and hydroelectric power. Can you pop your answer? down or um, pop it into the chat box please so true or false okay 
if we can have a reveal please yep we've got the colorado river now this actually supplies 40 million people with their water supply um through um the, the regions and the states across the usa right uh question number four please so transportation in USA's Western Desert is extremely limited. Most people travel around on horseback. There are few dirt roads. True or false? Pop your answer down. If you can, either on paper or in the chat box live. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be more the SUVs than the horses. <laughs> Right, okay, let's have our reveal, please. Okay, so it's actually false. So obviously we're talking about the USA here. So there are, is an infrastructure and actually Route 66, which you might have heard of, it's quite famous, links many of the major urban areas. Right, question number five. The USA's Western Desert is increasingly popular retirement, tourism and recreation destination. Can you decide whether you think that's true or false? Okay, hopefully this is a nice and easy question. Right, can we have our reveal? Fantastic, yeah. So although this low population density is overall in the whole desert, it's actually got a lot of large cities like Las Vegas, um, Phoenix. And as I said before, they actually have 31 million tourists a year in Las Vegas. So it is a very, very popular destination for recreation. Lovely. I'm going to uh, go back over to Brendan now, please, um, for some MCQs. Many thanks, Suzanne. So though we've done a, a whistle stop tour, a kind of marathon around hot deserts of the world and things you need to know about them. We're going to finish with a sort of sprint finish. Imagine this is the last hundred meters. So 10 questions about deserts. We're going to start with a few about adaptation. So the first question is which term, by the way, with these, only one answer is right. These are not like the bubble quiz. So you only have to choose one. Please type it in the chat. Which term is often used to describe the type of hot desert plants which are adapted to store water in their structure? Is it A, coniferous, B, succulents, C, deciduous, or D, non-deciduous? Which of those is correct? And the answer to that one is B. Succulents. Succulents is a term which means any kind of plant that stores a, a quite a lot of water within its structure. Let's have a look at question number two. Apart from discouraging hungry or thirsty animals, which of the following is a function of the spines on a cactus? Is it A, protection from sand particles, B, insulation from solar radiation, C, insulation from heat loss at night or d protection from fire choose your answer is it a b c or d some good answers on question one let's see if we've got some good answers on question two as well so make your selections please and we are going to see what the correct answer is which is c insulation from heat loss at night and that's because the spines trap a layer of air around the cactus and that can protect them from heat loss it can also protect them in the daytime as well by the way against uh, the drying effect of of the hot desert winds let's have a look at question three so here's a photograph of a beautiful desert animal called fennec fox You'll notice it has quite large ears. It's often found in the Sahara. Um, so why would it have lo such large ears? Could it be A, to enhance heat loss from its body? B, to look attractive to other foxes? C, to frighten away predators? Or D, to stun their prey? So we've got some encouraging answers coming in there. And uh, the correct answer is, in fact, A, it's to enhance heat loss from their bodies because the ears provide 
extra surface area so they can lose a lot of heat that way. Um, so there may be other reasons. It helps them to hear better as well, but uh, certainly to enhance heat loss. And several other desert animals have a similar adaptation. Right, question four. Golden moles, which again are beautiful desert creatures, uh, very difficult to see. They spend a lot of time um, underground. But uh, golden moles live in hot deserts such as the Kalahari in Africa. They have non-functioning eyes. So they have eyes, but they don't work. So they're sightless and operate at night. What is such behavior called? Is it A, vernal, B, autumnal, C, diurnal, or D, nocturnal? Make your choices. So the answer to question four is D, nocturnal. Any, any animal which is nocturnal in this country, we'd have animals, you know, a lot of animals like foxes and badgers tend to be nocturnal. It's quite common behavior and it's probably especially important in deserts uh, because of the temperature issue. So question five. In hot deserts, some darkling beetles, you get darkling beetles in different environments, but in the desert, dark, darkling beetles can trap water from moisture in the air to drink. What process do they rely on to capture the water? Is it A, transpiration, B, evaporation, C, condensation, or D, evapotranspiration? Which of those would be correct? Make your choice for question five. And the correct answer, one of the people have got that right. Well done. If you did, it is C. And C is for condensation as it happens. And what they will tend to do is perhaps clamber to the top of a, a sand dune, put one or two of their legs up in the air. And because their legs are cold, the moisture in the air condenses onto the legs and then it just kind of drops down their legs and then they can drink it. Very, very clever adaptation. Number six, please. Which of the following is often a cause for soil erosion on farmland in and around hot deserts? Is it A, overgrazing, B, overwatering, C, underwatering, or D, undergrazing? Make your selection for question six. And the correct answer, number six, is overgrazing. So when animals exceed the capacity of the land to produce vegetation and trampling and so on, it, if they really can destroy the vegetation and then there's nothing to hold the soil together and soil erosion occurs. Let's have a look at number seven. What is the name of water bearing layers of rock? that can provide valuable water supplies in hot deserts? Is it A, Quirock, rock, B, layer, C, Aquilaine, or D, aqua? Make your selections. We have some correct answers. So seven, if you got it, the correct answer is D aquifer and we can do a little etymology on that word it's from the latin meaning water carrying and the fer is a bit like uh, ferry as in car ferry you know we, we get that word from the latin as well so it's water carrying rock and you can see in the photograph there how the water carrying rock emerges in certain places that we call oases uh, number eight please so question eight is what name is given to the lifestyle of tribes such as tu the Tuareg who move from one place to another in hot desert environments? Are they called tectonic, B nomadic, C economic, or D tropic? What is that lifestyle called? Is it A, B, C, or D? All of them end in IC, but the correct answer for this one is that they are all nomadic. So nomadic peoples tend to move from one place to another. Well done, Ben there, I can see, got that correct. Number nine, please. 
what problem can sometimes be caused by too much irrigation in hot deserts? Is it desalinization, A, saltification, B, salinization, C, or desaltification, D? Make your selection for number nine, A, B, C, or D. Tricky one, that, because some of those words are quite similar. The correct word you should have chosen is C, salinization. And that is when the evaporation that it takes place in a fairly extreme way, because it's an extreme environment, um, means that the salt deep in the soil tends to rise up towards the surface. And that can be problematic for crops because salt and plant roots don't always go together well. Number 10 is the final question. What type of technology is in use in this image? There's a helpful hint here. Local people are involved and these structures are cheap and easy to build or maintain. Is it A, appropriate technology, B, high technology, C, low technology, or D, computer technology? Make your selection for number 10. And the correct answer, number 10, the last question for this week is A, appropriate technology. So hopefully you will have studied examples of appropriate technology, which as the hint suggests, are cheap and easy to build or maintain. So thank you very much to everybody for taking part. That's absolutely brilliant. We're back to our panel, you can see. And thank Fantastic. you very much, everybody. Uh, thanks, Jim. What have we got next? Well, uh, I need to look at the schedule, actually. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll... I've we'll got look. coastal landscapes. Really uh, I think is, you're is right. It coasts? Yeah. Yeah, coasts. I think that's so. Right. Uh, what we're going to do is... I know we, with Easter holidays, we're looking at uh, different times, uh, mornings, maybe continuing late afternoon. So what we'll do is, if you're subscribed to the YouTube channel, you'll get an alert as soon as all the, the next sessions for GCSE Geography are lined up. Uh, also, don't forget, at any stage, if you go to tutordu.net forward slash live, you can see all the upcoming sessions. Um, and also, you can go back and take a look at the slides and the videos of all the previous sessions. So that might be really useful if you're doing some revision over Easter ahead of some assessments uh, when you get back. Fantastic session. We covered a lot. I, I mean, I, yeah. I'm just trying, I'm going to see if I can Google a, a pet shop to see if there's anyone selling fennec foxes or golden moles, because I quite fancy... <laughs> Something a little bit different from my arid, hot desert back, uh, landscape in my back garden here in Yorkshire. Um, Probably I, easier to look after than that camel, Jim. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. Hump. He hasn't moved, has he? He's, he's a good boy. He's a good lad. Fantastic he's session. <laughs> yes, he's got a um, fantastic session. A huge thanks to Suzanne and Vicky and Brendan for putting the session together and for leading us through it. Well done for those of you who've joined us live. Well done for getting involved under time pressure. If you're watching on replay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, hopefully you found the session useful uh, and we'll catch you on the next one. So from all of us, yeah. we'll see you later. Okay, bye. Bye.